Hello friends and students, today we will look into the different perspectives of human rights and its evolution and also the philosophical evolution of human rights. Human rights are those norms which exist with a claim to protect all people everywhere from severe political, legal and social abuses. Examples are violation of the right to freedom of practicing religion of one's choice, the right to a fair trial when charged with a crime, the right not to be tortured especially in a police custody or even the right to education and opportunities. The philosophy of human rights would address basic questions about the very existence, content, nature, universality, justification and the legal status of human rights. The strong claims made on behalf of human rights such as those that they are universal, inalienable or even exist independently of a legal enactment have frequently provoked skeptical doubts and has countered philosophical defenses. Today they can be studied as a subfield of political and legal philosophy with a very substantial literature produced in its favor. To have a general understanding of the idea of human rights, I will identify four defining features. The purpose of defining features is to answer the questions of what human rights are with a description of the core concept rather than a list of specific rights. Two people can have the same general idea of human rights even though they might disagree about which rights belongs on what list of such rights and even about whether they are universal moral rights and if these moral rights exist at all. Starting with the general concept does not commit us to treating all kinds of human rights in a single unified theory for an argument that we should not attempt to theorize together universal moral rights and international legal human rights. The features which I mentioned earlier are 1. Human rights are rights. Most if not all human rights are claimed rights that impose duties or responsibilities on their duty bearers. Rights focus on a freedom, protection, status or benefit for the right holders. The duties associated with human rights often require actions involving respect, protection, facilitation and provision to provide the same. Rights are usually mandatory in the sense of imposing duties on their duty bearers. But there are some legal human rights which seem to do little more than declare high priority goals and assign responsibility for their progressive realization. One can argue of course that goal like rights are not real rights, but it may be better to recognize that they comprise a weak but useful notion of a right. A human rights norm might exist as a a shared norm of actual human moralities, b a justified moral norm supported by strong reasons, c a legal right at the national level where it might be referred to as a civil or a constitutional right and d a legal right within international law. A human rights advocate might wish to see human rights exist in all these four ways. The second feature is that is number two, the human rights are plural. If someone accepted that there are human rights, but held the view that there is only one of them, this might make sense only if the person meant that there is one abstract underlying human right that generates a list of specific rights. 
But if this person meant that there is just one specific right such as the right to a peaceful assembly, this would be a highly revisionary view. Human rights addresses a variety of specific problems such as guaranteeing fair trials, ending slavery, ensuring availability of education and preventing genocide. And of course, in the present day times providing of health care. Some philosophers advocate very short list of human rights, but nevertheless they too accept plurality. Feature number three, human rights are universal. All living persons have human rights. One does not have to be a particular kind of a person or a member of a specific nation or religious group to have human rights. Included in the idea of universality is some concept of independent existence as well. People have human rights independently of whether they are found in the practices, morality or law of their countries or culture or anywhere else. This idea of universality needs several qualifications, however. Such qualifications can include some rights such as the right to vote, which are held only by adult citizens or residents and apply only to voting in one's own country. The second example could be human rights to freedom of movement may be taken away temporarily from a person who is convicted of committing a serious crime. And in the, in the same line, the third example could be some human rights treaties which focus on the rights of vulnerable groups such as minorities, women, indigenous people and children. Feature number four, human rights have high priority. Maurice Cranston held that human rights are matters of paramount importance and their violation in courts is a grave affront to justice. This was proposed by Maurice Cranston in 1967. If human rights did not have high priority, they would not have the ability to compete with other powerful considerations such as national stability and security, individual and national self-determination and even national and global prosperity. But high priority does not mean that human rights are absolute. As James Griffin would say, human rights should be understood as again quotes resistant to trade offs, but not too resistant. Variation within human rights are for example, when right to life conflicts with right to privacy, the latter would generally be outweighed and would prevail. We could add another set of five additional features and these features would be in forms of questions. A. Should human rights be defined as inalienable as many of you would do? Inalienability does not mean that rights are absolute or can never be overridden by other considerations. Rather, it would mean that its holder cannot lose it temporarily or permanently by a bad conduct or by voluntarily giving it up. It is very doubtful that all human rights are inalienable in this particular sense. One who endorses both human rights and imprisonment at as punishment for serious crimes must hold that people's rights to freedom of movement can be forfeited temporarily or permanently by just convictions in serious crimes. Perhaps it is sufficient to say that human rights are very hard to lose. B. 
should human rights be defined as minimal rights? A number of philosophers have proposed the view that human rights are minimal in the sense of not being too numerous, a few dozen rights rather than hundreds or thousands of rights and not being too demanding. Their views suggest that human rights are or should be more concerned with avoiding the worst than achieving the best. One such philosopher is Henry Hsu and suggests that human rights concern the lower limits on tolerable human conduct rather than great aspirations and exalted ideals. When human rights are just modest standards, they leave most legal and policy matters open to democratic decision making at the national and local levels. This would allow human rights to have a high priority to accommodate a great deal of cultural and institutional variation among countries and to leave open a large space for democratic decision making at the national level. Still, there is no contradiction in the idea of an extremely expansive list of human rights and hence minimalism is not a defining feature of human rights. Minimalism is at best seen as a normative prescription for what international human rights should be. Moderate forms of minimalism have considerable appeal, but not as part of the definition of human rights. C. Should human rights be defined as always being or mirroring moral rights. Philosophers coming to human rights theory from moral philosophy sometimes assume that human rights must be at bottom moral rather than legal right. There is no contradiction however, in people saying that they believe in human rights. But when they are legal rights at the national or international levels, Louis Henkin observed in quotes again, political forces have mooted the principal philosophical objections, bridging the chasm between natural and positive law by converting natural human rights into positive legal rights. And can mention this in 1978. Theorists who insist that only human rights are legal rights may find, however, that the interpretations they can give of universality, independent existence and high priority are actually very weak. D. Should human rights be defined in terms of serving some sort of a political function. Instead of seeing human rights as grounded in some sort of independently existing moral reality, a theorist might see, might see them as the norms of a highly useful political practice that humans have constructed or evolved over a period of time. Such a view would see the idea of human rights as playing various political roles at the national and international levels and would also be seen as serving thereby to protect urgent human and national interest. These political roles might include a providing of standards for international evaluations of how governments treat their people and specifying when use of economic sanctions or military intervention is perm permissible in such cases. Political theorists would add to the 
four defining elements which I mentioned earlier, a kind of view which may be plausible from the very salient international human rights that have emerged in international law and politics in the last 50 years. But human rights can exist and function in context not just involving international scrutiny and intervention such as a world with only one state. Imagine for example, that an asteroid strike has killed everyone in all the countries on this earth except let us say New Zealand, leaving it the only state in existence. Surely, the idea of human rights as well as many dimensions of human rights practice could continue in New Zealand even though there would be no international relations, no international law or politics. And if in the same scenario a few people were discovered to have survived, let us say in Iceland and were living without a government or a state, New Zealanders would know that human rights governed how these people should be treated even though they were stateless. How deeply the idea of human rights must be rooted in international law and the practice should not be settled by the definitional fiat. We can allow however, that the sort of political functions that two important political philosophers of recent times John Rawls and Bates would describe are typically served by international human rights today. The next question leading to the next level would be how can human rights exist? A philosophical question about human rights that occurs to many people is how is it possible for a such a right to exist? Several possible ways are explored to find out how they exist. The most obvious way in which human rights come into existence is as norms of nation and international law that are created by enactment, custom and judicial decisions. At the international level, human rights norms exist because of treaties that have turned them into international law. For example, the human rights not to be held in slavery or servitude in article 4 of the European Convention of the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms as mentioned in Council of Europe 1950 and in article 8 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights which was approved by the United Nations in 1966 exists because these treaties establish it. At the national level, human rights norms exist because they have through legislative enactment, judicial decisions or custom became part of a country's law. For example, the right against slavery exists in the United States because the 13th amendment to the U.S. constitution prohibits slavery and servitude. When rights are embedded in international law, we speak of them as human rights. But when they are enacted in national law, we more frequently describe them as civil or constitutional rights. Enactments in national and international law is clearly one of the ways in which human rights exist. But many have suggested that this cannot be the only way. If human rights exist only because of the enactment, their availability would be severely limited and would be dependent on domestic and international political developments. 
Many people have looked for a way to support the idea that human rights have roots that are deeper and less subject to human decisions than legal enactments. One version of this idea is that people are born with rights and that human rights are somehow innate or inherent in human beings. One way that the normative status would be inherent in human beings is by being God given. The United States Declaration of Independence 19, sorry, 1776 claims that people are again in quotes endowed by their creator with natural rights to life, liberty and pursuit of happiness. On this view, God the supreme lawmaker enacted some basic human rights. Rights possibly attributed to divine decree will be very general and abstract. For example, to include abstract notions of life, liberty etcetera, so that they can be applied to thousands of years of human history and not just recent centuries. But the contemporary human rights are specific and many of them presuppose contemporary institutions. For example, the right to a fair trial and the right to education. Even if people are born with God given natural rights, we would still need to explain how to get them from those general and abstract rights to a specific rights found in the contemporary declarations and treaties. Attributing human rights to God's command may give them a secure status at a metaphysical level, but in a very diverse world it does not make them practically secure. Billions of people who do not believe in God of Christianity or Islam or Judaism do you think human rights won't exist for them? If people do not believe in God or in the sort of God that prescribes rights and if you want to base human rights on the theological beliefs, you must persuade these people of a right supporting theological view. This is likely to be even harder than persuading them of human rights legal enactments at national and international levels provide a far more secure status for practical purposes than those which are based on divine views. The only probable way that human rights could exist independently of legal enactment is by, is by being part of the actual human moralities. All human groups seem to have moralities in the sense of imperative norms of interpersonal behavior backed by reason and values. These moralities contain specific norms. For example, a prohibition of intentional murder of an innocent person and of specific values, for example, valuing human lives. If almost all human groups have moralities containing norms prohibit, prohibiting murder, these norms could partially constitute the human right to life. The view that human rights are norms found in all human beings and human moralities is attractive, but has serious lacunas and difficulties. Although Worldwide acceptance of human rights have been increasingly rapidly in recent decades. For example, universal human rights in a world of diverse beliefs and practices. Worldwide moral unanimity about human rights still does not exist. Human rights declarations and treaties are intended to change the existing norms 
not just describe the existing moral consensus. Yet, another way of explaining the existence of, hu of human rights is to say that they exist most basically in true or justified ethical outlooks. On this account, to say that there is a human right against torture is mainly to assert that there are strong reasons to believing that it is always morally wrong to engage in torture and that protection should be provided against it. This approach would view the universal declaration as attempting to formulate a justified political morality for the whole planet. It was not merely trying to identify a pre-existing moral consensus. It was rather trying to create a consensus that would be supported by very plausible moral and practical reasons. This approach would again require commitments to the objectivity of such reasons. It holds that just as there are reliable ways of finding out how the physical world works or what makes buildings sturdy and durable, there are also ways of finding out what individuals may justifiably demand of each other and of their governments. But if unanimity about human rights is currently lacking rational agreement as available to human beings, if they will commit themselves to open minded and serious moral and political inquiry. If moral reasons exist independently of human construction, they can when combined with true premises about current institutions, problems and resources, they can generate a moral norms which can be different from those currently accepted or enacted. The universal declaration seems to proceed on exactly this assumption. One problem with this view is that existence as good reason seems a rather on a thin form of existence for human rights. But perhaps we can view this thinness as a practical rather than a theoretical problem. For something to be remedied by the formulation and enactment of legal norms, the best form of existence for human rights would be to combine robust legal existence with the sort of moral existence that comes from a widespread acceptance based on strong moral and practical reasons. Thank you for watching. We will continue with the normative principles and the evolution of human rights in the next video. Thank you.